I think we're going to start now. It's about 30 seconds to go. Let, we want to squeeze as much goodness out of this panel as we can. So let me start by introducing my colleagues on the panel. Uh, I feel like I know them both so well that I could actually read their little bios here and know whether or not they're telling the truth. Uh, but um, J. Christian Adams here is the president and general counsel of the Public Interest Legal Foundation. And they're very important in that they file lawsuits to try to enforce election integrity across the nation. And a lot of them are done proactively. Uh, so what you'll see, uh, in fact, wasn't the, um, uh, you, you had a role, I know that Judicial Watch also claimed some credit, but didn't you have the role in the recent purge of the Los Angeles voter rolls? Well, I mean, we send nasty grams to California, but we've been suing Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, other places, and places in the Rio Grande, Star County, Zavala County, on the same theory. The That's same great. Theory. And, and the theory, by the way, is that if the voter rolls are clean, right, you have less raw material with which to commit voter fraud, right? So that's why that's important. From 2005 to 2010, he served in the voting section at the United States Department of Justice voting section. Uh, President Trump appointed him to the Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. Uh, you were also a commissioner for the United U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, um, and you currently serve on that, do you not? Correct. I'm the last Trump appointee in the federal government through 2025. Uh, I, hope you're, I hope your life insurance is paid up, uh. my friend. So he, he's, he's been, as you, as you heard him mention, he's been involved in election uh, lawsuits, I guess, in over 30 states and Guam. Guam, too. Yeah, Guam case. It was an eight-year lawsuit. Guam banned my client from registering to vote because he wasn't a Chamorro. Oh. Didn't have the right racial heredity. That's an interesting thing for an actual U.S. territory that's not like a... Uh, a Native American reservation or something, right? Wow, okay. So uh, Chad Ennis is an interesting fellow because um, he, he actually, he, he was someone I had the pleasure, some might say the misfortune of working with for uh, some time at, at Texas Public Policy Foundation and um, not content to merely allow that period of time to expire, he sent his son to be an intern in our office to carry on the legacy uh, so uh, Chad's an attorney. Don't hold that against – actually, they're both attorneys. Don't hold that against these gentlemen. And what uh, – Chad uh, was my partner two years ago during the legislative session where we helped uh, uh, testify for and, and wrote white papers on behalf of several of the bills that were turned into law. And one of the advantages of, be of having some seniority is in one particular hearing – because the left shows up and they've got hundreds of people that, that, that show up to complain. Uh, I stayed uh, uh, Chad so he could get some dinner. Uh, and then uh, when he came back, I left. I went home to go to sleep. He was in that hearing room literally for a few minutes shy of 24 hours in a row, were you not? Yeah. I, I think when I walked out of the Capitol, a rooster crowed. Yes. Ah. Yes. Uh, so that's what it's like to testify during legislative session. Uh, before he uh, showed up and, and joined our team and before he joined the Secretary of State's office where he created the very first audit process that you may have seen that audited, among other things, Harris County and uh, looking at their election processes to see whether or not that they were up to state uh, statute and standards. Uh, prior to that, he was in private practice, may, mostly litigating on patent and intellectual property disputes Kind of means he's a smart guy, but don't tell him that. It goes to his head. Uh, he graduated cum laude with a degree in chemical engineering. Is that like Breaking Bad? Uh, from the <laughs> University exactly of Missouri like in Breaking Columbia. And he also got honors for the University of Texas School of Law. So without any further ado, let's kick this thing off. And gentlemen, what I wanted to start off with was to ask, uh, starting with Chad and then getting some comments from our, our expert from all around the country, uh, uh, Christian, tell me about the audits. What was it that you were looking for with the audit process that you helped create with the Texas Secretary of State's office, and what did you find? Oh, I, I can talk. We got some time. Uh, so we started the, the audit division. The Secretary of State ordered uh, at the end of, of 21 ordered a full audit of four of our largest counties, Harris, Dallas, Collin, and Tarrant. Uh, two blue, two red. Uh, so that created my job and 
our division. We started from scratch in February of 2022 uh, with really a mandate of go figure out what needs to be audited. We didn't have any script. We didn't have any guidance on what we were looking for. Uh, so we, at first we went around, we talked to people like Christian, uh, folks like that, to figure out what, what should we be looking for. And what we came to was really a deep dive into election records that I will tell you the state of Texas is the only state that's done this. We dove deep. This isn't a recount. It's not a uh, uh, cyber ninjas type thing. It is a let's go to the base level and let's look at the election documents and let's see if the books balance. Because elections are about books balance. You got people that show up, you know how many that is theoretically, and you know how many ballots come out the end. We hope that matches. And most of the time it does. Sometimes it doesn't. So we went we went down, I think we ended up reviewing I have I'm an auditor and an engineer who's terrible about remembering numbers, so I had to I had to make a cheat sheet. But we uh, we reviewed 369 gigabytes of data, uh, gigabytes with a G, um, and um, that's a lot. Um, and here's some of the findings. So I'll go some of the big ones through. Um, I think I want to deliver the message though at first that what we found was if you follow the Texas Texas election code. If you have good procedures in place and follow them, you have you can run a really good election in Texas. You can feel very confident of that. Uh, I think two of our counties showed that really well. There are mistakes. There are things we found. But if you follow the code, you're going to get a pretty good election. And Collin County and Tarrant County show you that. Um, Harris County? Um, we'll start with them. No, no, really? Wait, we'll start what? with them. I am shocked. Uh, they're our largest county, uh, as you all know. Um, so we found, and this is all in the executive summary, if you really need sleeping material, here is the report. Uh, 369 gigabytes of data gone down to 370 pages. Uh, when I bring this to things, I, do, I don't like to carry it around. So if somebody wants it, you can have it uh, at the end of this. Uh, we can use it as a door prize. But so for Harris County, we found... 14 locations that lacked chain of custody for what's called a mobile ballot box. And so mobile ballot boxes are card size, credit card size, uh, memory stick, if you're an older technology, that store the ballots as you cast them on the machine. We found 14 locations. It's about 184,999 ballots that we could not establish a chain of custody for. Uh, what that means is just what I said. That's all I established. I can't can't give you a chain of custody for it. Uh, people will ask me immediately, is that fraud? Do you have any evidence of fraud? No, I don't have any evidence of fraud. I have evidence that I don't have chain of custody for 184,999 ballots. I also don't have any evidence that it wasn't fraud. Either way, I don't care. Uh, we had 17 of these cards that were read in that we really don't have any documentation for how or when they were created. We, we can kind of trace things back and kind of put two and two together using some logic, but we don't really have, again, a chain of custody or a, or a creation document that shows that. Uh, we had 26 locations, or 26 early voting locations, eight election day locations that the ultimate tally that was counted don't match what we got out of the poll book. Um, we had one of the problems and one of the reasons, like, why'd it take you so long, Chad? We started in February, went to December. Um, they had 534 banker's boxes of election records without an inventory. So we had to dig into each one of those boxes to determine when we say we don't have chain of custody, we wanted to be sure that it wasn't in box 533 and we missed it. We were very careful. Um, so that's Harris. Those are the big headlines from Harris. For Dallas, um, Dallas had an entire location that wasn't counted, uh, voting location. It was 153 ballots uh, that, that didn't make it into the, in the tally system. Um, they lost, <coughs> and when I say lost, they lost 318 provisional ballots. They lost them. Uh, 63 of them should have counted if, 
if they would have gone through the process and not been lost. Um, 21 voters voted by mail, but we had their sealed mail ballots. So that raises questions for us. I have your ballot sealed in an envelope, and it says you voted by mail and it was counted. Um, so we, we found a single individual that this would be something near and dear to Christian's heart. We found a, a single individual that assisted on 393 uh, applications for ballot by mail. The same individual was the assistant. Um, and one thing we found, Dallas had very good processes in place. They didn't seem to quite connect well. Um, and, and so we saw documents that showed, in some cases, that they should have had 60,000 um, plus mail-in ballots. We saw other documents that showed they should have had about 78,000 mail-in ballots. And frankly, we saw numbers all the way in between. Um, and so, let's see. We found 800, and what, a couple more, 813 provisional ballots were included in the canvas as the final tally that were counted. Uh, but the records we reviewed showed that actually 895 were marked as should have been counted. So 813 were counted, 895 were marked as should have been counted. Um, and what, what I think is really great in, in Dallas, we've gone through Dallas there. Dallas has uh, taken our report and gone through it line by line. And everywhere they see something that Dallas got dinged for or we didn't see this, we didn't have this, the record's not good. Dallas is actually going through that and saying, in justifying to their leadership, what are we doing to change it? I, I mean, it makes the, the guy who wrote the report so happy because that, that's exactly what we want, right? We want this to be a tool that they can use to, to make elections better. And I will tell you, the other counties, as they went through, um, actually, as we asked for stuff, they were saying, oh, you asked for that. I'm not sure how to get that to you. That's a problem in my system. I need to fix it now and fixed it before we even issued a report. Um, so that's kind of what we did. Um, and the result is is big, big fat. Uh, we're on to four more counties now, uh, four random counties that we drew out of a bucket. We drew Harris County again mm -hmm. as one of the big counties. We had two or two over 300,000, two under 300,000. We got Harris uh, and Cameron above 300,000. And below 300,000, we got Guadalupe and Eastland, um, since we got west. Wow. So, Christian, tell me about how this stacks up with best standards and practices and what you see in other states. And also, st let us know what, sh what should come out of something like this. And if I can remind both of you, like, as close as you can to your, your mouth, since we're trying to get a, a good recording out here. So, Right. So... <coughs> Um, I have to tell you, I see this in every state, meaning I, I have a 50-state perspective. And in most every state, except one or two, Texas being one of the two, the state election officials are in a perpetual defensive crouch. Like, we don't do anything wrong. There's nothing happening wrong. Everything's great. We don't need to self-examine. And to give you an extreme contrast, the Public Interest Legal Foundation has been litigating against the state of Michigan because they have 25,000 deceased registrants on the active rolls, some of whom have been dead since 1990, okay? 1990, 1997, 1998, and these have like names like Polish names, right? These are not mixed up John Smiths, right? These are very unique names, unique birth dates, they're dead. We put the obituaries, you can look at our Twitter feed actually today. There's a couple of obituaries from people who died in the 90s that are still on the active rolls. Okay, Con and Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary, uh, Secretary of State of Michigan, is extremely aggressive defending her office. She got these dead names years ago from us and she doesn't know anything about it. Nothing wrong in Michigan. This same attitude is prevalent across the country in state offices. Contrast that with Texas. In Texas, you have the program that Chad's talking about to self-examine, to say, what did we do wrong? What can we do better? Um, there are probably some problems. I can't think of another state that admits there's any problems under their tent. I'm serious. So I kind of get a chuckle when I think of Texas because of how good things are here, okay, compared to Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia. Pennsylvania's a wreck, okay, a wreck. 
Wisconsin's a wreck, Michigan's a wreck, uh, Colorado's a wreck, New Mexico, Arizona, all these states are in a state of self-denial, largely, about any problems. They're defensive. They're examining. Let's talk a bit about mail-in ballots. So um, one of the concerns that I had <clears throat> in examining the Texas uh, process was that as our basic laws never really changed all that much, other than the, there was a tightening up of mail-in ballot processes <clears throat> that we saw in the special session in 2017 that I testified in favor of, where literally the two most populous states, Texas and California, swapped their rules regarding who can touch a mail-in ballot you know, from a, a, a direct relative or someone with power of attorney to really just anyone, whether you could get paid to collect them or not. So prior to 2017, California had tight rules and Texas's rules were loose, and literally the two states swapped, right? Uh, and so what you saw then in Texas was in 2010, about one and a half percent of all the votes were mail-in. It went up to a, a, around a little over 6% in the 2016 cycle. In the O'Rourke Cruz cycle, as I recall, it went over 8%. And then with the COVID 2020 cycle, it was a little over 10%. Meanwhile, in California in the last cycle, uh, 2020, I think it was like 86%. And uh, is it six states that are all mail-in? And so part of the challenge, and I'll, 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 I'll finish with this, and then I'll ask you, you know, why we should be concerned about mail-in balloting. Some of you may have seen that there was a city council member in Lodi, California last week that was arrested on multiple felony charges. He was a naturalized citizen from Pakistan, and evidently there's a number of uh, people from Pakistan that have made that area their home, and he was accused of having pressured his fellow Pakistani immigrant community into essentially handing over their votes to him, and that's how he got on the city council. And he was uh, arrested and charged with multiple felonies. And it just seems to me that one of the challenges we have in this area is that a majority of voters, including Republican voters, love the convenience of mail-in balloting, and yet it opens the barn door to things like blowing up the secrecy of your ballot. Because once that ballot's sent to your house, who knows what's going to happen with somebody who might come to help you fill it out. So what's the threat of mail-in ballots to our form of representative government? Christian? Okay, for a couple things, I'll try to be a little faster, but there's a lot here. First of all, the, I don't want to give control to the people who deliver me my neighbor's mail, right, to pick our leaders. That's the first problem. Second problem is it decentralizes things. You can't have an election official. Chuck asked what happens in the kitchen. I know because I actually put up a case in federal court. Let me introduce you to Patsy Roby. Patsy Roby, and it's all in my book, Injustice, if you want to read more details. The book's 11 years old. I'm not selling it right now. I'm just saying it's in there. Uh, Patsy Roby was a ballot collector out of the mail in Mississippi in a place, place called Noxabee County. And Patsy would go from mailbox to mailbox and pull the ballot out of the mailbox and knock on the door. In small, vulnerable communities, connected notaries, because they need a notary in Mississippi, people who are politically connected have lots of power over the weak and vulnerable. Because that's how people get jobs in places like Mississippi, in Noxabee County. If you don't, aren't connected to the political structure, you don't get food. It's that simple. So Patsy would go door to door, take the ballot to the people she knew, and said, here's your ballot. Come on in. Let's vote. I put a witness up in federal court named Susie Wood. I wish you could all see the transcript. I wish I could mail it to all of you, the transcript from this federal court trial. Susie Wood was a voter who allowed Patsy Roby to vote her ballot. Now think about it. If someone came to your door, said, I have your mail ballot, can I please come in and vote it for you? Everyone here would say no. So Susie Wood testifies that she allows Patsy Roby, the notary, to vote her ballot every election. Judge Tom Lee, federal judge from Mississippi, was so shocked by this, he asked a question in the trial. And those of you who are lawyers know this doesn't happen very often. And the federal judge said, said Ms. Wood, I want to ask you a question. And I, I don't mean to be intrusive, but can you read or write? And she said, yes. And he said, then why on earth are you letting other people vote your vote? The answer is, I swear to you, this is in the transcript. She goes, because Patsy always knows who the best person to vote for is. 
This was a, an answer under oath in a federal court trial. So I'm telling you there's a cultural overlay here about the weak and vulnerable and the politically connected and mail ballots. And that cultural interaction produces results for certain factions. And, and mail balloting is, is something we need, and we need it in a limited way. I mean, are people who are homebound and can't get out, they have to have a way to vote. But if you look, and this is outlined in the report, uh, if you look at what I said earlier, number of people that show up, number of ballots come out. If you look at our, our data on, er, on election day voting, one day voting, you see the balance is pretty well. Do a pretty good job one day. Early voting, we got two weeks. Numbers get a little bit, a little bit off, but we're still pretty good. Start adding the complexity. Provisional ballots. It's a small amount, but they still, they need to move around a lot, right? They need to go to the voter registrar. They need to go over here. They need to go over here to evaluate where they should be counted. All of a sudden, numbers, you lose a few here, gain a few here. You look at mail balloting. When we're talking in a county like Dallas where we had 70,000 mail-in ballots, uh, which is a ton to deal with, then you see problems keeping track, administrative problems. Uh, and that's, that's the problem when we go to these huge 10%, 20% mail-in ballots. The, the administration of the election becomes much tougher. Yeah. Let's, uh, let, let's get into uh, a topic that I know is on the minds of some of the people here in, in the room. Uh, and it's, it's a little complicated, and it's uh, somewhat controversial. And it's this national system somewhat national because uh, the first and fourth largest states aren't part of it, uh, but it's the ERIC system. Uh, and if you look at the system and how it was created and the purpose for its creation uh, back when it was started, and then you look at who's involved with it today and how it's used today, uh, Christian, could you let us know a little bit about what was the original kind of the founding mission uh, how is it used today, and why is it that a place like California or New York is not a part of, of, of the system? Okay, Chuck, remind me if I don't get to one of those, because I have answers for all of them. All right. Okay. ERIC, what is ERIC? It is the Electronic Registration Information Center. It's a consortium of about 31 states. The states are ERIC. Texas is in, er is in ERIC. Now, I testified to the Texas House, I don't know, four years ago when you guys were considering ERIC, and I, or maybe it was five years ago, six years ago now, time flies. And I said, don't join Eric, join the free one, which is the Kansas State Crosscheck Program. Well, the left litigated that into oblivion. So there is no more Kansas State Crosscheck. So now I've changed my tune and say, it's probably better to be in Eric than out of Eric. Um, I wish I had never written about Eric. N nobody hardly knew. I wrote a piece in like 2020-ish, 2019, talking about Eric and the guy who started it named David Becker. I worked with him at the voting section. David is a very, very intelligent, hardcore leftist. And he started it, started it with Open Society Institute grants. That's magic word for you guys know everyone. Soros, right, right, right. I didn't want to say it. Um, so they started with Soros grants through Pew Charitable Trust, and then they just pushed the ship offshore, meaning it is now unrelated to Soros. Now, you don't, if you read Gateway Pundit, you won't believe that. Uh, because, but the point is it is. It's not a Soros organization anymore. It had its origins in Soros money, but it's not. Now what does Eric do that's good? Let me start there. There is no other way to find people who are registered and voting in multiple states, Texas, Arizona, te well, Texas, uh, Texas, um, Virginia, Texas, Florida. Florida's an Eric. Without Eric, you can't find people who are voting in other states very easily. Now, you could do what the Public Interest Legal Foundation did and spend nearly a million dollars buying all the voter rolls from all the states, putting it in one database, and seeing who's voting across state lines. But Eric does it for the states. And by the way, if I went to, to uh, Florida with all this data about cross-state voters, they're going to turn to Eric to validate. So Eric has a role. What is the bad part about Eric that people don't like? Well, it's origin story. But I think that's like 13 years ago, because now Texas is Eric, not David Becker. They also don't like the fact that this data is being uploaded 
your voter files are being uploaded for analysis. Well, guess what? I did the same thing at Public Interest Legal Foundation. It's public information. Your voter file is a public record under federal and state law. So the public record is being uploaded to be amalgamated at the Eric mothership, and then Eric talks back to the states and says, here's the people who have died, here's the people who are in multiple state registrations, here's the people who moved out of Texas and moved to Nebraska, right? So they help states clean their voter rolls. Some people are concerned where else that information is going. I don't know the answer to that. But it's public information. Correct. So l l let me ask, though, to, as, as a follow-on to that, wasn't it true that in some jurisdictions uh, previously, maybe back closer to the launch, that some states, for example, that aggressively use motor voter to sign people up, right, at their, st at their state when they get their driver's license, right, that they were using the ERIC data to essentially get out the vote or to basically register people? Wasn't that, didn't that happen somewhere? Thanks, Chuck. That was part of the devil's bargain, okay? I left that out. When you become an ERIC state, a comparison is made between your driver's license list and your voter list. Whoever is on your driver's license list but is not registered to vote gets a mailing, encourages them to register to vote. Now, I'm of the mindset that every, if, if listen up, guys, if every, if every American registered and voted, every American registered and voted, we'd have, elect more Trumps than Barack Obamas, okay? I'm convinced that we're still a good country. We're still a conservative right of center, love America, love the flag, love limited government, love liberty. So I'm convinced if everybody registered and vote, we'd be better off. Now, I know that's a little bit against the wind and some, you know, I used to not think that, by the way, but I think the 2016 election convinced me otherwise. So w w let's get back on that card, though. That doesn't happen in every jurisdiction, though. It does. does. It's all it does. part of the. It's okay. all part of the devil's bargain to become right. part of Eric. It's called the um, unregistered. Uh, there's a term they use at Eric. Do you remember UBE-ish or something? It, it, it's something along those lines. Yeah. Right. Uh, so who does that in Texas then? Our our office sends those cards out. Okay. Uh, in the unregistered. But eligible. But eligible, that's it. You, Unregistered UBE, but eligible. I knew there was yeah. a term. UBE. And, you know, Eric, um, and, and we don't really know what the yield rate on those cards is. Like, you know, you send out however many, how many people actually register because it, it directs you to the website uh -huh. to tell you how to vote or how to register. So you lose visibility at that point. We do lose yeah. visibility. You know, one thing about Eric, and I'll go back to one thing Christian said is Eric is our only source for cross-state moves. So when Chuck decides he's through being the professional former <laughs> Californian and wants to be the former Texan. Not likely, and, but yeah, yeah. And moves to Florida uh, because he's retiring. Um, then In your dreams. Then we'll get a note from Eric that says Chuck moved. And that's the only way we get that unless Chuck calls his voter registrar and says that. Yeah. And that's not insignificant. I have the number. In the last six months, we've removed 100,485 100, voters have been removed based on that cross move. Right. And that's out of 1.1 million that have been purged from the rolls for whatever reason. So it's a, a decent so chunk. It's a good chunk, and that's the only source the, of data we have for it. Last thing about Eric, and I'm, we may end up getting some questions, but when you look at why California and New York are not members, yeah. right, isn't isn't it the case that they're not members because, among other things, Eric helps identify non-citizens, or, or essentially, you know, like in a state like Texas where we actually check, right? Well, why aren't they members? Okay, I, we have done at PILF a deep dive into New York's registration lists. New York's voter rolls are so totally corrupted, Eric doesn't want them. They will pollute the system, the ecosystem, because they have people with missing PII, no dates of birth, placeholder information on addresses, um, missing first names. The New York voter rolls are a disaster. And if you crank that into the ERIC process, they don't want it. Now, I can't speak to California. I, I don't know why, but I do know New York, yeah. they don't want it. Well, <clears throat> I can tell you why. In California, they don't want to be part of it because they're afraid it might remove ineligible voters. So it's really pretty, really pretty yeah, simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> if you look at the if you look at the things that we can do here in Texas to improve 
the integrity of our elections. Uh, what more needs to be done that we haven't had the opportunity to do? And I'll, I'll pitch it to you, Chad. You know, I think, like we said, the, elect the Texas election code is pretty good. Uh, you know, I hope what will happen is that the legislature will pick this report up and identify what they think are holes and, and <coughs> try to fill them. You know, we try not to, at Secretary of State's office, get get too uh, too far out on telling the legislature what to do. That's right. their good their idea. Purview. Yes, no. they don't no. like that. <laughs> so, but you know, there are there are certainly uh, still some things to be done. Uh, especially, you know, as you said, our, our mail-in ballot processing has been a work in progress. As you just noted, it's been changing. We've been strengthening it. Uh, there's always work to be done there. Um, so, yeah. Let's, let's talk just a minute uh, again and once again about mail-in ballots. One of the things that I found in my research that was alarming, <clears throat> and, and Christian, I'd like you to comment on this, is that in 2016, in the Trump uh, uh, Clinton cycle, when I mentioned we had, I think, a little over 6% by mail. And then you saw uh, people like uh, Soros or Tom Steyer pour a lot of money in in the 2018 cycle, hoping to turn Texas blue. Uh, and a lot of that was in voter registration and, and trying to get people to vote by mail. And at the time, uh, our vote by mail system in Texas, it's been changed, it's been made uh, tougher now. It simply said, if you're disabled, check here. There was no, I swear or affirm I'm disabled, here's what the definition is. It's just check here. <clears throat> and what we saw in the 2018 cycle was a gigantic increase in people voting by mail who were under age 65. In, in Texas, if you're over 65, 65 and older, you automatically qualify if you want one. If you're under 65, you have to claim a disability or be out of your home county for the election period. So the only way you get to vote from home if you're under 65 is if you're voting, uh, if you claim a disability. And so what we saw was the average age of those people under the age of 65 who requested, who claimed a disability, went from age 42 in 2016, which is the mean between 18 and 65. It plummeted from 42 to 36. So I guess in 2018 in the O'Rourke Cruz cycle, right, for that Senate race, there must have been a lot of people in their 20s wearing casts or, or uh, going around in wheelchairs compared to before. I mean, how did that happen? I, I mean, maybe they had service dog poodles or something. I, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, that, that's an astonishing statistic um, that I can't fathom is replicated. That almost, to me, smells like there was campaign pushing an idea that you can vote that way. I mean, that's so unnatural. Um, Chuck, I got to back and tell you one thing about Texas. Um, there was a, a question you posed to Chad, because you guys won't hear this anywhere else, not from the Secretary of State's office, I doubt from the legislature. I get to see the whole country, what's going on. What state of office is effective? Who's cleaning things up, like Cord Bird in Florida, the Secretary of State there? You guys can make a change here that would make a big difference in election integrity. Your Secretary of State's office is like the Beatles song you say hello and I say goodbye, hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye. You know that song from 1967. The Secretary of State under your state law is constantly changing and they can't ever get their sea legs and they don't have any political clout. And so they're, they're like in a, this like two year, one year window where you, you, you constantly are changing personnel. I bet you've had, what, eight Secretaries of State in the last five or six years, right? That's the worst system in the country. Elect them, give them clout. Give them four years where they can do what you guys want them to do. There's my, my well, non-Texans view. Speak, speaking of elections, uh, we, have a, we have an interesting challenge here. Some of you may know that shortly after the 2021 session, uh, in December of that year, the Texas Criminal Court of Appeals uh, followed up on this uh, criminal case involving a sheriff who took some cash donations, I think out in East Texas, uh, and didn't properly report, wasn't, wasn't uh, properly showing, you know, obviously cash donations in politics are, you know, something you should restrict. And so the case went all the way, it was appealed all the way up, and it was decided by our criminal court of appeals, Texas kind of has this unusual system where we have this dual court system with a Supreme Court that decides uh, civil and constitutional questions and a criminal court that, that deals with, the, you know, criminal uh, cases. And they discharged, the, they, they threw the, the conviction out because under our system, 
the prosecutors work in the judicial branch. It's part of our continental law heritage going back to Imperial Spain. And so, uh, but the AG, the Attorney General of the state, is an executive branch official and therefore under our Constitution, in spite of multiple statutes that have been passed over the years, the AG can only do constitutional and, and civil uh, claims. And so we have, we need to fix that because right now in Texas, the ultimate person who's going to go after election fraud is the county DA, who in some cases might be the beneficiary of local machine corruption, right? So how do we fix that? Well, the one way to fix it is you can have a constitutional amendment, but that takes two thirds in each chamber and then you all have to vote on it. There is another fix, and my understanding is we should start to see some legislation very soon coming out in this session, and that is to create five districts across the state of Texas where you have a judge and a DA, right? They don't have to be equal in population, but five districts that will do nothing but look for election fraud problems. Now, why five? Because the legislature had funded and wanted the AG to get up to five prosecutors backed up by 12 to 14 investigators, which really is pretty modest in a state of 30 million people, you'd think, right? And one last thing about why this is important that I'd like to add, seek uh, commentary is that the left will always say about Texas, show me the evidence, show me all this fraud that you're concerned about. And I'll look at it and say, well, you know, 17 years ago, we had half of a prosecutor looking for election fraud in Texas at the AG's office. 12 years ago, it went from one half to one. That person was taken off during Hurricane Harvey to pursue price gouging allegations. Then it went from back to one, and then finally we got three. Three in the state of Texas looking at election fraud. It takes each prosecutor about two months to develop a case, right? So if you look at the, the over time, 17 years ago to two years ago, 150 or so cases uh, where you have convictions. It's like a formula. Every prosecutor can do one every two months, and it takes 18 months to two years to develop because these are complex cases. Yeah. As a former prosecutor, I, I tell you, these are s really hard cases. And having a dedicated, trained group that knows how to do these cases is very important because it, it's a fraud case where half of the evidence is a secret. We have secret ballots. You know, once you vote, you, it's in the kitty. We don't really know. So having people who know how to interview witnesses, know the law, know how to build these, comp they are complicated cases. Uh, is very important. Christian, what's best practice that, that you've seen? If you look around the country, um, I if there were more prosecutors looking, do you think we'd find more cases? Well, for sure, and, and Florida's been through this. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second. People are also afraid to bring these cases as they get attacked in the media, right? North Carolina prosecutor uh, brought some voter fraud cases and, th and the left went after him personally. So that's part of their strategy. Florida had the same problem. We did a sweep, Florida has really good FOIA laws, we did a sweep, found a, this is a report we did called Safe Harbor. I've got like three copies, you can get it online at Public Interest Legal. We found 164 election crimes referred by county election officials, not by kooks or cranks. These were county election officials, referred election crimes to state prosecutors, county prosecutors, I should say. They're called state's attorneys in Florida, so I get confused, but they're county prosecutors. Out of 164, Guess how many were prosecuted? I hear the right answer is zero. None. So this is why Governor DeSantis got a state prosecution unit passed through the legislature. Because they weren't being prosecuted, and here's the proof. Wow. That, uh, <laughs> it's just elections. Come on, you know? I mean, uh, what, why are you trying to be mean to people? Well, right? Chuck, the Hillsborough, which is Tampa, election office said, we don't refer any election crimes to anybody because we're a Soros election office. I mean, they didn't literally say that, but Soros funded these people's elections. Nice. Well, that's one of the reasons why, of course, we need a system like the one I just mentioned where you have a regional DA, right, so that you at least get it out of the county where some corruption might be occurring. Uh, so I, I think that's a pretty important thing to, to focus on. Uh, one of the things that um, um, uh, we're, we're looking at in Texas uh, is not only of this, this, of course, but also tuning up some of our election laws. Chad, do you have any particular things that you thought 
were left undone from the last legislative session that you'll be looking at this legislative session? Uh, you know, there's there's a lot out there. Um, I think there were, we're up to 40 or 50 election bills that have been filed, um, you know, all, at least. Uh, everyone's interested in stuff. We're still kind of sorting through all the ideas. Um, but I think we just, you know, I think, you know, I'll be selfish. Uh, you know, continually to fund my office, I think does a lot. Uh, I do think, you know, what we've done at the Secretary of State's office uh, by, as Christian, you know, Christian pointed out, we're not all states do this. And having our election officials show their work is so important because most election officials, as Christian can tell you, give you the stiff arm. And if you don't understand, you couldn't possibly understand the complicated thing we do. And it is complicated, but we, we can understand it. Uh, we'll figure it out and and help us and help educate the public. So when when we get a, a an election and someone loses, they say, well, it's because I got fewer votes, not because I got jobbed. Uh, so I mean, I really think the audit process has been great, and and I really hope. Yeah, I'm, I'm not biased, uh, but I really think it that that the Texas should be proud of it and. Uh, we should keep that up. Christian, you were talking about the difficulty, I think both of you, uh, the difficulty in bringing some of these cases, uh, just to uh, kind of in a depressing observation, right? Last Monday, a couple of days ago, when I was testifying before the Texas Senate on a bill that passed out a committee that would restore felony uh, provisions for several aspects of election code violations that had been felonies and were uh, in many many people think were er erroneously downgraded to misdemeanors in the last session. Uh, one of the uh, witnesses who testified uh, as an expert witness um, uh, was Jonathan White, who was the head of the Texas AG's <coughs> Election Integrity Unit. And what he's doing now, I'm sure it's very important, but, but the point is he's not doing elections. He's going into, he, he's doing Medicaid fraud because we don't have anyone now at the AG's office who does that. He's actually doing easier cases now. Medicaid fraud is Right, easier. right, easier cases. Sorry, great, <laughs> great. Well, I think that uh, I'd like to move things to questions of the audience. Um, we, you know, I could talk to these uh, smart guys all day long. Uh, I do rely on them. By the way, I mean, w we at the foundation, at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, there's a lot of phone calls and uh, well, also a lot of meetings. And just to let you know, uh, one of the, the cadences that I operate under is that I'll have monthly uh, Zoom meetings with other uh, people who also do what I do from all over the country, and we share notes about what's going on in your state and what sort of challenges are you seeing and what kind of laws are you looking to pass that will improve things. So this is something that you have to constantly work on because there are people out there who, for whom political power is all they care about, and they don't really care how they get it, right? So let's go in the back here. I think I saw, yes, right right here in the back. And, and you have, we have a microphone, so please wait for the mic to get to you. And always, by the way, end your question with a question mark. You know, it has kind of that upward inflection, you know, and so, and also tell us who you are. Uh, Elio Rosa from Midland. Uh, I just like clarification. Well, thank you very much for what you, do, you guys do. Thank you so much. Uh, so. Two clarifications. Uh, Mr. Adams, you talked about 48 states being uh, in self-denial and two not being uh, in that condition. One it's Texas, what's the other one? Well, look, don't hold me to that ironclad. It's generally right. So I, mean, I, could, I, I would take too much time. Uh, Florida being the other one. Okay. I mean, maybe Louisiana, maybe M Mississippi. Alabama used to be good. Oh, Mac Warner in West Virginia is very good. Okay. Um, but I'm telling you, it's probably about 42 states that are in outright self-denial, and six of them are in the middle. Right. And this is the second one for, uh, for Mr. Ennis, Chad Ennis. Uh, you, you talked about 100,000 people moving out, I mean, votes of moving out of Texas. Was it 2022, you said? I just wanted that, a clarification. That's been uh, voters that have been removed in the last six months wow. based on cross-state moves. Yeah, just to let you know, the U.S. Census Bureau provides an annual estimate of interstate migration. And it, it, generally speaking, over the last 15 years, this is really general, 
approximately 300,000 Texans move out of the state and 400,000 other people from other parts of the country move into the state for a net of about 100,000 a year. And that's pretty much a typical year. So that's when, when you hear Chad talk about 100,000 removed, if a typical year is 300,000 outbound, that's, that's 150,000 outbound, of which a lot are children, the kids, yeah. right? And some who are not citizens. So that's pretty much, you're probably getting everybody, or virtually everybody. It's a pretty good number. Uh, you know, we won't get the states that aren't in Eric. Right. So, I mean, I don't know who. Not a lot of Texans go to California. I, mean, I don't know but, who's you going know, to California yeah, for it's Texas. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, over here, and please wait for the mic, sir, because we are recording this, and doesn't matter how loud you are, we want to have you on your on our live stream. So, uh, making our microphone runners work here. Sorry about that. Um, t Tom, tell us again who you are and then your question. Uh, this is Thomas Camardo. I'm from Austin, Texas, an election worker. Thank uh, you for your work, by the way. Yeah. Very important. Uh, Mr. Annis, um, according to the Texas statute, my understanding is that when you register to vote in Texas, you have to put your primary residence in. Who, if anyone, is checking those residences for business addresses, and how do they get deleted from the roll? Okay, I may have to punt to chat on this only because I'd have to pull out my chart to go state by state. I will tell you only one thing. Residency is often a state of mind, and that's one of the problems here. But, Chad? So our counties are the primary registrars, so it's going to come up through the county. Some counties have pretty good systems to recognize, depending on the software they have, depending on what the bells and whistles they've paid for. Uh, some of them will say, if you register at a business address, They'll, they'll get you right away and say, they'll send it back to you and say, you're trying to register, you don't live at this factory. Uh, other counties don't do as well. Uh, I think we catch some of them when they come up through the system, but um, it's primarily a county process. It, you, Microphone. It, it'll vary from county to county. Yeah, so there was a bill um, last session by Senator Betancourt out of Houston that outlawed registering from P.O. boxes because as he pointed out, it's kind of hard to live in like this little two by three inch, like little tiny people, right? Uh, so you'd think that that'd be common sense, right? There's another type of registration that's in a gray area. I think I learned about it from you uh, in our conversations, uh, Christian, uh, in that there are people who, for whom life on the road is, is kind of what they do. They live, live in RVs and they go to different states they're American citizens, they have the right to vote. And so in many cases, you'll see them register out of these commercial uh, uh, boxes that aren't PO boxes, but they're, they're sometimes they're residences, like you know mailboxes, et cetera. And it's hard for our laws to kind of account for that because they have to vote from, they, they have the right to vote from somewhere, right? Uh, and you look at this and you're just like, how can, how can 30 people be voting out of this house? Well, I asked you that question and you're the one that told me, yeah, it's not, Great, but these are citizens who own RVs. Right, and the people I drove by coming here that are living under the bridge have a right to vote too, and they can use a P.O. box. Uh, and if some of you have seen the movie Nomadland, the one I think best picture two years ago, an Oscar. It's about people who live on the road. Polk County, Texas, I don't even know where Polk is, I know some of you do, is a hotbed for this sort of registration, is Polk. Now, based on that law from Senator Bentcourt, Last, last year, if you are if you're a homeless person, you can actually say my residence is under Mopac, and I get my mail at a post office box. So you, you you're supposed to register where you live, where you hang your hat, right? And then you can you can register separate where I get my mail. Two two things together. All right, we have a question in the front row. Actually, two very and because they showed up on time to. We'll do you both in a row because you, you're sitting in the front row. All right. You're very, very gracious. <laughs> anyway, uh, my name is Dave Zinker, and I had, I had a comment and a question. And the comment is, is that until we get these five districts that you guys are talking about, it sounds like compliance is discretionary. So you were saying, Chad, that, that everything is pretty tight and everything's pretty good except for Harris County. But, but it seems like I don't know who I would fuss at and expect to get some action. You know, so that, that's right. number one. And number two, um, 
you know, regarding the uh, regarding A.G. Paxton's filing in the United States Supreme Court, to, I think he filed with like 18 other states to attempt to get the election reviewed in in uh, in uh, 2020 in the in the what I I believe is a stolen election. But in any case, so that that never occurred. So I, I just solicit your comments uh, regarding. In, in my opinion, uh, the Supreme Court made a horrific error. So, uh, because they did not take the case and they, they did not uh, they did not execute their responsibilities. So, number one, where would a guy fuss if he thought that uh, if he thought that his election was um, if he thought that that his vote wasn't counted or his elect there's something wrong with the election in in Flower Mound and just comments on the Supreme Court's declining the case. Let, let, let me first. There's a, a bill that's been filed for this legislative session that would increase or establish civil penalties of I think $1,000 a day for non-compliance with uh, citizens who allege uh, irregularities or fraud in their electoral um, district. It basically forces, it, it gives the right to, to bring the suit to a defeated candidate, to a party, there's certain specific officials that have standing in the race that they give the right to in this bill. It would require then the election officials to respond and to, uh, to basically uh, reply to every single one of those complaints. And then if the person who filed didn't like the responses, they could essentially appeal. Uh, and there's a process whereby then there could be $1,000 a day fines. There could also be uh, receivership for specific precincts that were so far out of compliance that essentially your vote didn't count at the precinct level. That, no, no, this is a proposed legislation this session. Uh, and it would put those precincts under state receivership for two federal cycles. Uh, so I think this is a, a needed uh, step. And then of course, the, you know, the, the, the legislation that is also going to be proposed about these five districts I think is also very important right now passed in the last session, we have a provision that says if you are a losing candidate, you can uh, allege fraud, and if any of the fraud is proven, you get attorney's fees plus $1,000 per instance of fraud. Nobody's used it yet because you can only be a, a defeated candidate, and it will not restore the, it won't change the election results. It could potentially bankrupt the people who took the vote from you. Now, to the other more uh, complicated issue regarding the Supreme Court and the 2020 election. Our courts have been terribly reluctant over time, and this is not recent, to enter into what they consider political questions. The challenge with 2020 is that something should have been done about it at the onset, and what you found was that people within the leadership structures, even within the RNC and even within the Trump administration, were so terrified of how terrified people were about COVID that like, oh, if you force people to vote in person, you're trying to kill us. Right? The opinion polls show that people were just blind with fear about this. And so what happened is people like Mark Elias, who had a plan to do certain things for 20 plus years and even talked about it in the months before COVID. Here's what we want to do about, for example, blowing up mail-in ballot safeguards. That gave them a perfect excuse to do what they had been planning to do for decades. And so the challenge was You've got to get on it immediately with lawsuits, and they didn't. Because what the courts say, here's what the courts say. Before the election, you don't have standing because nothing's happened. After the election, well, it's moot because the election happened. And that's why we need the Supreme Court. We, we, we can't have a, a back and forth. We need the microphone. Real so quick, please. real quick on this. Uh, and just to give you an example of what Chuck talked about. I was litigating against the state of Pennsylvania over... Uh, some issues involving motor voter, uh, deads and non-citizens on the voter rolls. I called my friends, which few there are at the Justice Department, I said, you guys have got to get in on this case with an amicus brief to talk about how the United States thinks that these records are public, the non-citizens shouldn't be on the rolls, and so forth. Okay? This was my colleagues, level-to-level uh, -level discussions. The Trump Justice Department didn't act, and this was a year before the election. And I begged and begged and begged. And all I'm saying is what Chuck said, is that the people who could have been doing something ahead of time were dropping the ball. It's not all about Paxton's Supreme Court complaint. That was like the death throes of the, of, of the Trump era. This was months in advance where something could have been done and wasn't.
Next question, right? Uh, we're not making you walk very far this time, so you're welcome. Thank you all. I'm Leslie Fitzpatrick. I was a former candidate. I just ran for the third court of appeals in the 2022 election cycle and lost by 54,000 votes in Travis and Hayes counties. I voted for you. Thank you. <laughs> and so I've always been all about election integrity. Our Republican National Committee woman, Tony DeShield, during our last legislative session started a Zoom call at fr on Friday mornings at 7 a.m. There's probably a lot of members that are on that call in this room. And there is a huge push by the grassroots to get rid of Eric. And what y'all didn't talk about is, yes, David Becker left Eric. No, it's but, worse. He's still there. Okay. Well, he's broadened his horizons by starting the Center for Election Innovation and Research, CIR, which that was one of the organizations that funneled that $419 million of Zuckerbucks that was used. And so the thing about Which, we, by the way, we've outlawed that in Texas. Yeah, and which is great. But the thing about it is, um, you know, I'm an attorney too. And what I've learned, Dana Myers is the vice chair of our party now. There, we are giving Eric information that's protected, i.e. social security numbers, driver's license numbers, in, in part of the package that we give them in regards to this voter information. And we can't work with other member states. Eric can do whatever they want with our information. They give our information to the SEER. And so I just think there's more education out there that's being shared, and I'm not faulting either one of you, but I think that, I mean, two states have already withdrawn, Alabama, Louisiana, and Eric is not the only game. It's an amazing in town. question, by the way. But oh, go yeah, ahead. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No. So, but, but I'm just saying is that um, the state of Texas needs something like this. But I think that we need to be open to the fact that maybe yes, it had negative underpinnings, but it doesn't, you know, those tentacles are still out there. L let me ask, do we provide the full social security number or is it the last four, and Eric? That I don't know. I think it's the last four. It's probably the last four, but I, I don't know the answer to it's that. Um, you know, Eric has got its problems. It's not perfect, and I think, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at if there are other options. We, our law requires us to be in Something. And I'm aware of that. And, yes. And so we're looking at it. You know, as states withdraw, you know, you're only as good as how much data you're getting into it. As other states withdraw, are we in a situation where it's not really effective because big states aren't in it? But we're, you know, we're, we're trying to fix it. Uh, I think everyone has that desire to to know that hundred thousand people. That's a real number. That's right. useful. Uh, so how do we get there, whether through Eric or through something else? Because uh, the alternative is to do what Christian did and spend millions of dollars. Right. And, and it's it, and we can't get. And, and there's a problem with. I mean, Christian does a ton of work on that. There's a lot of data manipulation involved. This is messy, messy data, and getting those databases right. together. Right. And and get it in a such a way because you want to be really careful. Yeah, one you, of the when you put someone in suspense, right? Because one of the yeah. challenges that we've been sued on before, we be in the state of Texas, is that in a state of 30 million people, there are actually quite a few people with the same first name, middle initial, last name, and date of birth, right? right? Uh, and that's not an uncommon thing. And then if you say, oh, this person voted twice, or now you could potentially be subject to a federal civil rights lawsuit for having suggested that someone shouldn't have been voting when, when they had the right to vote. And so that's part of our challenge. Well, and one more thing, there's a federal law that only gives you 90 days to clear up the voter rolls, correct? Well, it's the federal freeze out under uh, the National Voter Registration Act. It doesn't only get, it, no, it's the, it, it freezes you for 90 days. It doesn't give you 90 days. It's 90 days before a federal election. You can't do routineless maintenance is what the statute says. Right over here, another front row person. 
Hi, my name is Jennifer Castillo, and uh, I am a current mayoral candidate for the city of Fort Worth, and I have a couple questions. So my first question is uh, for uh, Mr. Chad Ennis. Do you have any information as far as Tarrant County? Because I know you touched a little bit about Dallas. So my question is, do you have any specific information on Tarrant County? Yes, yes we do, yes Perfect. we do. Uh, <laughs> I will leave you with this. No, I mean, I think at, at the end of the day, uh, Tarrant had some issues as well. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm trying to think of what they were. Then I'm just, uh, I can look at my report. Uh, but Tarrant had some issues, but overall, Tarrant did a pretty good job. Uh, you've got an election administrator there that's really conscientious. Uh, they make mistakes. They've had some technology problems. Here's one Tarrant made. Uh, so Tarrant had a problem in 2020 that they got a lot, their, their vendor for mail-in ballots uh, basically messed up and the, the ink was too light to be read by the scanner. So they had to duplicate a lot of those ballots onto a better stock of paper. We reviewed a portion of those and we found two that were just completely marked wrong. Uh, wrong candidate marked, copied over. Now. Again, what was the process in place? The process in place was this was done with a Republican and a Democrat. It was done in a bright room with large TVs. Do I think it was a fraud or even more than just an error? error? No, because that's a good process, right? So you know that's kind of some of the things we saw about Tarrant. You know, they had some of the same problems we talked about earlier with how many mail-in ballots should have been counted. Uh, I think. All four counties had problems with that, Collin included. Uh, it's such, they got crushed with so many more because of the COVID uh, that they were all pretty overwhelmed with it and the numbers aren't good there. It seems uh, that we have a common theme here that keeps recurring about mail-in ballots. Let, let, let me, just briefly, there's a challenge here with philosophy about voting, right? And it comes down to this. And by the way, from a statistical standpoint, I agree with Christian and his contention that if every American citizen who was eligible registered and voted, we probably would have better election results. Uh, there's this myth among the left and the, and, and the, the left-wing journalism community, which is 99% of them, that, that somehow it, you know, just getting more people out to vote is gonna benefit the left. I don't, I don't agree with that. Okay, so, but when it comes to mail-in ballots, there's an important distinction because there's that very high risk that the ballot could be cast without any secrecy or by someone other than the person whose name or is designated to be casting that ballot. And so part of the challenge is, is that the way the left views rights is they view them collectively, right? You're part of a group, you're a woman, you're LGBTQIA, you're, you're uh, you know, a person of color, whatever. And, and with that view, then, it's important that all the people within the group that you think is behind you go to vote, even if you have to vote for them, right? right? Exactly. And if you're against that, then you're for voter suppression. If you're opposed to that, if you somehow have this quaint notion that people should be voting in private. Now, this is an argument we've had in this country back to our origins. One brief historical example. In the decades around the time of our American Revolution and in in, in a couple of decades after, it was, un, it was not uncommon to vote in public. And back then when capital was scarce and there was hardly any gold and silver in the country, if you were a farmer, you owed someone money in that county. And so what would happen is, they, you know, are you a Federalist or are you a Democratic Republican? Are you gonna vote for, for Jefferson or Adams, right? And everyone who's voting for Jefferson go in this corner of the room, just like in the Iowa caucuses. Everyone who's voting for Adams go in this corner of the room. And if you're the guy who, who has the mortgage on all those farmers and you're voting for Adams because you're a Federalist, you're going to look, excuse me, Farmer Smith, you know, you, you really? You want my money for next year's planting? You better get over here and vote for Adams, right? So they're, they're right there is one of the reasons why we have the secret ballot. Right? And we even had this argument at our founding. So this is not something that's unique or weird or not alien to us. We've actually grappled with this in the past. 
Did you have a second question? Uh, yes, you touched on it a little bit. My second question was, uh, are there any other initiatives done for increasing voter turnout? Because for example, in my city, there's less than 10% of the people who actually vote in local elections. So I'd like to change that number. Yeah, the local elections challenge has always been a big challenge here in Texas because what ends up happening is a lot of these local jurisdictions like to have off uh, election elections because they want to control the people who vote. They want to make sure that if you're a city employee, if you're a city vendor, right, if you're one of the people that, that helps uh, you know, underwrite the bonds or whatever, you're going to get out and vote because you want to help control that city or that school board. Uh, we did have a little bit of election consolidation, I think, uh, two or four years ago. The argument opposed to that is that if we run city council elections during the federal elections, then we're going to get lost in the... In, in, in all of the confusion and all of the ads and no one will know who we are. Uh, and so that's the counter argument, right? I think on balance, it's probably better to have fewer elections with more things on the ballot so more people are gonna get out and vote. But otherwise, the only solution is you gotta go door knocking and you gotta spend some money and get your vote out to vote for you because otherwise, the people who will be determining the future of Fort Worth in those low turnout elections are going to be the people who have a direct stake in the Fort Worth city governance, right? And so then it's harder for the average citizen to win. Uh, another, let's go in the back to Adam here wearing, what is that shirt, Adam? It's, it's got your last name on it, doesn't it? Oh, okay. Metallica. Enter Sandman. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, uh, to and, you, and your name? My Not name is Adam Khan, which you just mentioned a second ago. Uh, before I get to my question, very quickly, I will say running city council elections concurrent with the general election is the one thing that we do in Austin that everyone else should actually copy. Um, it's a much, much, much better system that way that we just deal with it in the general election. Uh, alongside everything else. Uh, but my question is, we've heard a lot of talk over the uh, past half decade, seven years, somewhere in that range about um, various voting procedures and the pluses and minuses of all of them. Um, what are your thoughts on over time migrating the way we conduct our elections over to some form of blockchain technology um, and allow uh, just in the interest of greater public transparency? And I'm not saying it's perfect or invulnerable, but it seems to be more resistant to outside manipulation than anything else we've come up with to this point. So just any thoughts you have on the subject. So this is something I hear something about occasionally, but I'm going to defer to people who probably have been doing this more full time. So, so over to you. Anyone want to risk? I'll start. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. So, Good question, by the way. No, it's a great question. We get a lot. Uh, every possible way you can vote has a flaw. It, just we'll. we'll our people, and I'm thinking Americans, will find a flaw and a hole to exploit. So, you know, the job of policymakers and the job of administrators is to make sure those holes are as few and as little as possible, and we know where they are and we guard them. Uh, to the way we do things right now, with uh, I know a lot of people don't like voting machines. Uh, I like an electronic count because I trust a machine to count much more than I trust a partisan hack. Uh, and you know, we check on the machines. I think one of the things we don't do as an agency and as a, as a policy team is say, look, after every election, we take what comes out of the machines, we do a count manually to verify that. Every county does it, uh, every election they do it. Uh, we actually went through in the report and did it again. We picked a small race and said, what's that race? What's the count in that race? And uh, we counted them by hand. And I will tell you, I don't, I'm not sure about blockchain. I don't know how it would work. But the hand counting, it takes forever and is mind-numbing. And I think it's more susceptible to fraud. I'll let Christian 
chime in now. The most important thing is to have a system that's trusted and getting people educated on what that would involve with blockchain is going to be the challenge. You're never going to have blockchain voting until people understand it and trust it. I think the, the key is having the accountability, having the checking between the two, you know, at least two major parties, you know, having eyeballs on the process, following the process. This has been a challenge from our founding, right? If you go back to uh, the years after Aaron Burr essentially politicized something called the Tammany Hall Society in New York, you see for the next 80 years or so, you see the machine that he unleashed in New York uh, basically taking elections and frequently affecting the entire state. Uh, and that was back when there was a lot more rural population in upstate New York than there is today. Uh, and they, it required them to do innovations like, for example, a glass ballot box so that when you showed up on election day, you could see that the ballot box was empty at the beginning of the day. Literally, a like a big fish tank, right? And then you'd put the ballots in. Uh, and, and, of course, once you do that, then there's other ways of cheating, right? That come you do along. it at the end of the day. You do it at the end of the day, right? Rather than stuff it at the beginning of the day. So there's all kinds of ways. One of the ways, one of the reasons why we have an electoral college, for example, is that there are different ways that we have enfranchisement, right? So in California, when you sign up to vote, your signature is proof in California that you are eligible to vote. In Texas, we actually check for your eligibility, your citizenship, don't we? We do. So there you go. That's one of the reasons why we don't want a national popular vote. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. I am so glad that you joined us today. Folks online, thank you for watching. Uh, election integrity is something that never gets finished. You must constantly be vigilant. You must constantly be monitoring the process for new loopholes that are being exploited, new ways to cheat, because it's never done. Thank you for your participation.